Cool, so we are going to be going over note one from CS70. This one is going to talk about, I guess, propositions and some different symbols we use when formulating propositions. So I'm not going to look at the symbols first. We're first going to define what a proposition is. And it's essentially a statement that is either true or false. So statement that is either true or false. Okay. And we have the following connectives, which are these symbols right here. So if we have two statements, uh, the common representation of them is a capital letter. They used um, P and Q. If you wanted to check if they were both equal, then we would use this upward facing caret. This means P and Q. If we wanted to see if one or the other one was true, and sorry, I didn't mean equal here, I meant true. Then this is or, and then similarly, I guess finally, this is not. So just your standard sort of operations. It's like what you would put in an if check in an if statement, you know, while programming. Okay, and we have this thing called the law of excluded middle, which is essentially says that if a statement P is true, then its opposite must be false. So if P is true, then this must be false. It's not possible for both P and not P to be true. Okay, and we're going to look at this concept check. So if we let P stand for the proposition three is odd, Q stand for four is odd, and R for four plus five equals 49, what are the values of these prop, uh, statements right here? Okay, so let's see, P and R. So three is odd, that is a true statement. So if we and a true with R, where R is a false statement, then the result is going to be false. So we can say that P and R is equal is false. Now if we take P or R, we know that the first statement P is true. So without even looking at the second statement, we know that we can return true. And R is equal to true. And if we did not Q, well, what is Q equal to? Four is odd, that is a false statement, but since we're nodding it, we're going to say that it is in fact true. Okay, so that's some pretty simple concepts. Really what we need to get down is the notation. Okay, now we're going to move on to truth tables. And we're going to write down, just to give an example of what a truth table looks like, the truth table for or. And it kind of looks like, you know, this thing down here. So I'm actually just going to make that really quick. Um, table is going to be like so. And we're going to have P, and let me just bold this top. So I have P, Q, and if we were to or these two statements, and I guess that should be bolded, what would that look like? Well, to say these are the different conditions. Right here, and then false and true, and then false and false. These are all the possible um, cases. So if either one is true, we return true. You know, this is the only case in which we return false. This is really just to give us an idea of what truth tables look like. Okay. Now we're going to talk about implications. An implication is essentially uh, an if and then statement. Um, the if part of the statement is called a hypothesis and the then part of the statement is called a conclusion. The only false case for implications is when we have a true hypothesis and a false conclusion. 
um, as we can see here true false yields a false um, this means this whole statement is false otherwise you know every other version is true and let's see uh, vacuously true um, I'm actually going to need to look that one up really quick so the example that they give in the notes is if we have a hypothesis that is false um, it turns out that the conclusion can be either true or false and our overarching implication will still be considered true so that's when it's considered vacuously tr true and the example they gave was if pigs can fly then horses can read and we know that both of these statements are false but since we're saying that if pigs can fly implies that horses can read since that is a false hypothesis implying a false conclusion the value that is yielded is actually true okay um, next we're going to talk about contrapositive and we should also talk about uh, converse. So what converse is, is actually illustrated right here. Converse is flipping the hypothesis and the conclusion. Contrapositive is flipping the hypothesis and the conclusion and then flipping the positivity of it, I guess. So we know both involves flipping. One involves switching the positivity I guess the polarity of the truthiness of each statement. Okay, so contrapositive, the one with the positive flips the positivity. That's how we'll remember it. Okay, and now we're going to talk about quantifiers. So um, the way we're going to think about this is by examining this example. And this says x squared plus 3x is equal to 5. Why is this not a proposition? Well, some obvious sort of a giveaway of this is that the the range or the scope of this problem is not really defined. It has to be over a specific like finite set. And that's where we use quantifiers. The quantifier is can be a couple different things, but one is like the kind of E sign that there exists. Um, and really it's to say there is something in this overarching set of something else. So for example, for every x in the set of z or integers, you know, that is quantifying over a finite set. That is something that we can do. And that's that would make um, you know, a proposition. Like if we if we were to say there exists some x in the set of integers such that this equation that would be a proper proposition. Um, and these are more examples for all integers x, 2x plus 1 is odd, that is a proposition. Um, it's not true, but it's a proposition. Um, this one, there exists an integer between 2 and 4. So um, let's actually just implement these really quick. Um, so we're going to say for all integers x, so we need the upside down a, and let me get it really quick. Right, so we write just our value and then whatever our set of values is in its own sort of section of this entire equation. And then we write the actual you know, function that we're checking against in a separate set of parentheses. So we're going to say for all x in z, where z is the set of integers, we're going to say um, 2x plus 1 is odd. And if we were to say that, how would we say that? I believe you would say something like For for all x in z, say 
something with 2n minus 1, right? Because, and would it be n? Would it be x? I believe we'd say something like for all equal to y and we would actually say y is equal to I'm not really the, sure what the proper notation would be for this actually. I will get back to, that will be one of my questions. I wanna say like two X minus one, something like this. I'm not sure if this is right. So I'm actually going to highlight it really quick. And we're gonna move on. Um, there exists an integer between 2 and 4. So we're going to say there exists. So let me see. We need to get that E symbol. There exists some integer x that is within z. I'll just use a regular z. Such that. Um, we're going to say x is less than 4, and then we're going to use the and symbol, which we'll take from up here. And x is greater than, wow, x is greater than 2. Okay, let's move on to De Morgan's Law. De Morgan's Law essentially says that if we have, and writing out these symbols is sort of consuming. Um, let me switch over to paint to just do it a bit faster, okay? So it's cool, it works for both and and or. And it says, if we have a statement such as this, let me switch over to purple, that is the negation of P and Q is equal to the negation of p or the negation of q. And similarly, the negation of p or q is equivalent to, and the way we actually write equivalency is by drawing three horizontal lines. This statement is the same as the inverse of P. Oh, did not mean to do that. The inverse of P and the inverse of Q. And we've actually written uh, the truth table for, I believe, the first statement. So let's switch over to our notes again. And let's just examine it really quick, right? So we're gonna say, not p and q all right p and q are true inverse of that is false not p is false not q is false false or false is false i'm just going to do this second one and then we can just look at the other ones on our own but um, p is true ending it with false yields a false value but we're negating that so we're getting a true value here we're going to do not true which is false and then not false, which is true, oring false and true gives us true as the result, okay? Now we're going to talk about negating propositions, which is a similar idea to the above statement. Um, we're going to switch over to lead, oh, uh, sorry. Jeez, I mean paint really quick to see what it looks like. Um, but essentially what it is, is if we have a statement that says the inverse of there exists some x um, such that you know p of x is true 
This is the same as for all x um, not p of x is true. And this statement would be true if we had also flipped the e and the a. If we had said the not of all x and p of x and yeah, basically if we had flipped them. And there's a good example in the notes that honestly does a better job than me and this video is pretty long already so I'm just going to I mean I remember the example it was where p of x is equal to um, x is greater than 10 and this, there's a set of numbers 1 2 3 and 4 and basically we look at these two statements here and see if they are actually equivalent and it turns out that they are so this is something that we should just remember and now we're going to switch over to our notes again. Okay. And also, uh, by that logic, if we want to push a negation sign through, like if we don't want our entire statement to be you know, flipped, we can push this through so that it looks like this. We don't need these. So that's what happens when you push that through. And then again, if we were to push it through one more time, we would get something that looks like this. All right, hopefully that makes sense. And then this is um, something that I had a question on, but I believe I have a better understanding of it. So we want to know why the following two statements or methods, I guess, are equivalent. And the key part is to realize that um, what we are asking is sort of loose. It's not fixed, and I'll, I'll sort of explain what I mean by that. So this is asking or proposing that there are at most three distinct integers x that satisfy p of x. This one says there exists some x, y, z um, that for all all d values, if p of d is true, then it must mean that d is equal to x, y, or z. So notice how in this case, x, y, and z can be overlapping. That's not something that we've excluded. However, we know that the farthest away from each other x, y, and z can be is if they are all different from each other, right? But we are not saying we are not giving four values and saying if p of d is equal to one of those four values then then um, p of d must be true we're strictly saying that for these three values p of d will be true it can be they can all be the same they two of them can be the same or three of or they can all be three different ones right and then this one is saying for all x, y, and z, such that none of these are equal to each other, it will never be the case that inputting x, y, and z and anding all of them will yield a unanimously, a unanimously true value. And what this is saying is basically that this is our ceiling. That if we try to have four distinct values, we know that at least one of them will have to be false. And that's essentially what the statement says. So that's kind of our, again, our ceiling. We can have any number of unique values below that and we should technically be true because this says there are at most three distinct integers x satisfy p of x. All right, so that has been note one of CS70 and hopefully that helps.